<clears throat> hey, Eric, can you see me? Oh, wait. Um, Can you hear me, Eric? Yeah.
Hello. Hey, uh, can you see or hear me on the video? I can. I can see you. I was just. I well, I can see your screen here. Okay. Are you on mute? Um, okay. I'm on. Yeah, I'm. Um. Hold on. I have to put my headphones in first so my microphone works. Okay, no worries. I just don't know what's going on. Yeah. <clears throat> because it says you're in and it and it says your video's on. I saw you for a minute and then I didn't. From the page that says video, why this matter? Okay, so you can't, but you can, can you see me? Um, I can't see you. That's so weird. It's just your, well, participant. Okay, let me figure yeah, out. Yeah, no, I was really just looking at your screen. Okay. I can't see, like, the gallery view or anything. There, I can see the gallery view now. Okay, so... Because I can see me. Okay. I can see you, yeah. Okay, all right, cool. Um... Yeah, sorry, I didn't realize there was a Bills game on tonight, so I apologize. <laughs> so I feel bad. Um, but the link worked for you? It worked. I created an account that was an ECC account, and I was able to join, and yeah, no issues. All right, so now you can see just the slide? No, well, I can still see the gallery view, but that I can open and close and then I can see the slides yeah but I'm not showing up well you're showing up on the, on the right side in the gallery view but that can that I can change <clears throat> all right but you can see the integumentary system slide yes okay all right so I'm gonna just start and I think it is why is it not recording what So it is recorded. Okay, no problem. All right. All right. All right. So you, I'm assuming your video's off, which is fine. Okay. So I'm just gonna get started. Um, I'm gonna turn off the phone, and you can hear me through the computer. Are you still there? Yeah. Can you hear me through the computer? Or are you just? Okay. All right, I'm going to disconnect the phone call, and then we are recording. Yes, sir. Thank okay, you. thank you. All right, so um, I guess I'll start. So I want to just kind of go over Chapter 5. I've been on the chatting with Pearson for about the past 40 minutes. So they're going to make sure you get into the right course without paying for a new mastering. And there's one of their students on the same problem, so it's not just you. All right, so uh, give me one second. <clears throat> so if you're in Jones 92448, we're gonna switch you to Jones 26968. So I hope that's the right one. All right, so we'll all be in the same uh, lab course. So all the assignments should show up there. We'll do those. Like I said, if you can't get in there for some reason, just do them in lecture and I will manually transfer the grades. All right, so I just kind of want to go over integument system. I can't see myself. I don't know like, if you can see me, but I am in a hotel room in Albany, so this is really awkward. But anyway, all right, so I want to go over the integumentary system. All right, so that's going to be the largest system of the body, largest surface area. All right, so we'll go over skin. A little bit of hair and nails and um, not a whole lot and then we'll go over some sweat glands and sebaceous or oil glands um, primarily in your skin they're there for protection we're going to secrete some kind of an acid mantle to inhibit my 
uh, microbial growth. We'll go over that a little bit. All right, so I'm gonna go over the layers of the skin. You can either figure it out from superficial to deep or deep to superficial. Just remember, the deep layer is gonna be near the subcutaneous fat layer and the capillary bed, right? And superficial is gonna be the stuff that you see going from your skin down deep to the tissues and the capillary bed, and then you'll get under your muscle and bone and et cetera. All right. So epi always means above or on. So epidermis is your superficial layer. That's what you're looking at with skin. And please realize your skin on the superficial layer is completely dead. It's just keratinized protein. They were originally, um, mitotic cells that were dividing and then from the basement membrane as they move up superficially, they start losing their ability to go through mitosis and they become less and less alive. All right. And just remember towards the very um, surface, just like your nails and hair in your skin, it's completely dead. All right. <clears throat> so your epider epidermis is actually what, if you're wearing leather or hides, that's really what you're, we're harvesting for leather or belts or shoes or, or whatever it happens to be. So it consists of epithelial tissue and it's avascular. So avascular means it doesn't have, have a blood supply. So if you scratch the surface of your skin, it's not going to obviously bleed. All right. So Remember too, your cornea is avascular, no blood supply. Uh, so avascular usually means it's dead. It has a very, very hard time uh, regenerating and some of them uh, don't regenerate at all because there's no mitotic division and they're completely dead. All right, so dermis without the epi, it underlies the epidermis. So that's gonna be um, just deep to the epidermis or the, the next superficial layer down. So it's the mice, the most fibrous connective tissue, and it is vascular, which means it does have blood supply. All right, so it is able to regenerate. So as we talk later about <clears throat> like a scratch or a, a wound, the dermis is gonna be able to heal. The epidermis really isn't gonna be able to heal. We're gonna bring in other um, layers that are alive, bring them in towards that area and start regenerating. And if they can't regenerate with um, the actual tissue, they're gonna, um, turn into fibrotic tissue, which will repair it, but fibrotic tissue doesn't really have any functional um, capabilities. All right, hypo always means under or below. Um, so that's uh, hypodermis is a uh, superficial fascia. And remember fascia is gonna be connective layers that connect all of your layers of skin and they connect your skin to the basement membrane and to the um, the muscle layer, the blood supply, and the capillary beds, and so on. <clears throat> so subcutaneous layer uh, is deep to your skin. No part of the skin, but shares some of the functions. All right. And it's mostly adipose tissue that absorbs shock and insulates. So if you're not sure what that is, just realize if you have the elderly population, their skin is relatively thin, and you'll notice they get really cold very quickly because they don't really have any adipose tissue. Um, deep to that hypodermis, the deeper layers, uh, it kind of goes away with age. So their skin's very, very superficial. They are more prone to bruising, contusions, uh, ecchymosis, patechia, all those skin disorders. And their skin tears relatively easily. And you'll notice that even in nursing homes, they're gonna have, it could be 80 degrees outside, and they're inside uh, with sweaters on, or outside with sweaters on because they're cold they can't really hold in any body heat because they don't really have that um, subcutaneous layer deep to the skin that has any adipose tissue in it, all right? So your hypodermis really uh, anchors skin to the underlying structures, mostly muscles. And if we're gonna do like any tattooing, we really wanna go down epidermis into the dermis and we're gonna go deep as possible because these layers don't generally um, regenerate as much of so the ink actually stays in those layers a little, um, for a longer period of time. <clears throat> all right, so there's a picture of the skin from the uh, epidermis all the way down. All right, and I copied and pasted this picture on a lot of the slides so that you can have a reference point. So realize this is superficial epidermis. And remember, this is all completely dead. It's just keratinized little pillows of, of tissue. So there's your epidermis, relatively thin. Here's your papillary layer. This is going to have all the um, ridges or derma. So this, if you look, the surface area here is <clears throat> very, very contoured. It's really for anchoring. So that if you brush against something, 
this layer doesn't really brush off. It's kind of like egg crating that really attaches it to that area. And then we'll get into all these different layers, whether it is the hair shaft or a lot of these, um, <clears throat> these sensory organs or the sensory nerve fiber with free nerve endings. And if you notice, these are really gonna be for pressure. All right, so you have to put a lot of pressure on here before you actually trigger these afferent nerve fibers, all right? And the um, arsenian corpuscles, some of these other things for fine touch are gonna be much more superficial in layer, all right? More superficial in um, orientation, all right? So the epidermis, remember this is the outermost layer that's completely dead. It consists mostly of keratinized, stratified squamous epithelium. So remember stratified, squamous, stratified means layered. Squamous is going to be those very, very thin layers, and they're stratified. They're there for protection. So these we kind of, um, <clears throat> we know they're going to slough off. We're going to be losing layers over and over again when you take a bath or uh, when you're sleeping, you brush against something. These are going to kind of slough off, and they're completely dead. All right. So there's four types of cells found in here. We have keratinocytes. Remember, site always means adult. All right. So these are... Um, I like to call them grown ass cells or completely adults. All right, they're pretty much differentiated. These are adult complete cells and they're gonna produce keratin, which is a protein. All right, produces fibrous keratin, protein that gives skin its protective uh, properties. And these are the major layer of the epidermis. And once again, these are just dead cells full of protein. They're there to keep water, microbial things off. They're kind of there as your first layer of protection against um, you know, anything, abrasion, cut, scratch, um, bug bites, or whatever, right? Tell you connected by desmosomes, and remember those connective tissue between the cells, they really wanna lock these cells in together so nothing gets in between these cells and can get deep into the tissue where it can infect or get into the blood supply or start uh, an infection in those tissues. And millions of these slough off every day. So remember, house dust and things like that's really just your dead skin, it's sloughing off. Right. And, you know, if we were in class, I talked to you guys about, you know, vacuuming your mattress or whatever, if you've never done that, you know, just <clears throat> when you change your sheets or whatever, you know, change the vacuum cleaner bag in your vacuum and vacuum and you'll be uh, shocked at what you pull out of your mattress. All right. It's just all dead skin that's just kind of sloughed off over time. All right. Melanocytes or melanocytes, however you want to pronounce it. Remember, these are grown cells. All right. And I'm sure we're all familiar with melanin. The melanin is really a pigment there to darken so that the UV rays really can't get into your, um, deep into your nucleus of your cell. And remember, if UV causes um, mutations in DNA, so we don't want that in the nucleus mutating those cells. So as you're exposed to the UV light or whatever, these, um, Monocytes will start producing melanin to darken the skin. It's kind of like shades or sunglasses for your skin so the sun can't get into the nucleus of the cell and start altering the DNAs. All right. So monosomes are transferred to um, keratinocytes where they produce, uh, they protect the nucleus from UV damage. All right. So dendritic cells or Langerhans cells, these are very specific dendritic cells. We'll talk more about this in the immune system. These are cells that are in your Periphery, they're going to be air in tissues that are exposed to the outside of your body or external environment. And their job really is to grab any uh, antigens or anything that's foreign, and they're going to put, they're going to send these cells or these an, uh, antigen particles to your immune system, to your lymph nodes, to present them to your B cells and T cells, so that hopefully we can have an antigen antibody reaction. Your your B cells should react and produce antibodies to this so we can tag them for the immune system. We can either block their entrance or produce antibodies to super tag them so your immune system or your T cells can actually attack them and destroy them. All right, so these are star-shaped macrophages. Macrophages or macrophages literally means macro means big, phage means eaters. They patrol the deep epidermis and their job is to go in and attack and consume any of these foreign particles. When macrophages consume them, they actually um, ingest and process any antigens on the cell so that we can uh, present them to your immune system so your immune system will 
have antibodies to the antigen, so we already have memory cells in the future against that specific antigen. So if we're ever attacked by that again, we already have an antibody recipe um, in the card catalog to produce antibodies to it. All right, so these are key activators of the immune system, and that's how they work. All right, and tactile or Merkel cells, all right, these are generally sensory receptors that are sensitive to touch, and these are gonna be very, very superficial, all right? Parsinian corpuscles are deeper, they're there for deep pressure. So if we look at the picture later, when you put pressure, you have to push way down to activate those um, specific cells. Tactile or Merkel cells are very superficial, and their job is to um, alert your body uh, when something lands. So if it's a, a fly or a mosquito or a spider, it's very, very light sense. It tells your those sensory cells <clears throat> travel all the way up to your homunculus in your brain, your cortex, and they kind of map out where things are in your body so that you know where they are. So let's say you were bit by a mosquito or a mosquito landed on you, you'd know exactly where to hit to kill that mosquito by these cells, right? <clears throat> so the epidermis is made up of four or five distinct layers. And the um, stratum lucidium, lucid means clear, like if you have a lucid dream or whatever, something's lucid, very clear. And that's really gonna be where you have a lot of layers, like the soles of your feet or the palm of your hands. They're very, very thin and clear. And these are really not in most areas of the body, but that is that fourth layer. So, or the, yeah, the fourth layer, four out of five, but not every part of your skin has all five layers. They're gonna have um, the basal or basement membranes, uh, spinosum, granulosum, and corneum. The lucium layer is only in generally the palm of your hands or the palm of, or the soles of your feet. All right, so these, the epidermis is a thick skin, contains five layers, and is found in high abrasion areas, hands and feet. So we have the thick skin, and that's because of this layer here. All right, most of their skin, as I said, only has um, the four, and that's the four basic layers, one, two, three, and five, right? So, you know, if we were asking you, like you were shot or stabbed or um, punctured by something, we wanna know, like, we could test you and say, well, do they know the layers? Well, it depends on whether they're gonna go from, you know, superficial deep. If they can um, tell us which layer is which, you'd have to, like give us the order of those, that way we'd know that you knew what each layer was. That's how we could test you on that easily. All right, so the stratum or basal layer, all right, so remember this is basal, always means basement. So if you're thinking about that, you know, say, well, what, is, what are they asking me? Well, the basement membrane is always gonna be the base. We talked before about apical or base. So apical is always your top sur um, superficial layer. The basal is always a basement membrane, and this is really where the blood supply is, the subcutaneous fat. So basal is always the deepest, so superficial to deep. Right, so if we go back here, talking about basal, the next layer up would be spinal granulosum, lucium, and then corneum is always going to be the top or most superficial layer of that. All right. So a layer that is firmly attached to the dermis. So these are going to be attached very, very deeply, very, very strongly. So if you, um, so you're attacked or wrestling or fight or whatever, we don't want the skin coming off. We wanna really attach it deep to that. All right, consists of a single row of stem cells. Remember down here, let me see the arrow. <clears throat> these are your stem cells. These are gonna have the highest mitotic rate. So just kind of get in your head that they're gonna start generating through mitotic division. They're gonna generate up. They're gonna be very, very alive here. As they go up, they're gonna become less and less alive. And what's gonna determine that is whether these are sloughing off a lot if they're a high resistance area or an area with a lot of contact, they're gonna to need to be replaced very, very often. So that's gonna drive the mitotic rate to regenerate all these cells from deep to superficial, right? And it says right here, one daughter cell journeys from the basal layer all the way up to the surface to replace that. So there's daughter cell, there's gonna be one that's gonna stay, that replacement cell is gonna migrate its way up here and replace it. So that's how your skin regenerates, you know, if things are working really, really well. Cells die as they move towards the surface. Remember, they're very, very alive here. As they get um, further and further up, they become less and less alive. And they're very, remember, the superficial layer is just gonna be 
completely dead keratinized tissue. And they're going to be that stratified squamous. They're literally there just as a barrier. And these are the parts that slough off continuously. All right. <clears throat> Layers also known as the stratum germinatum, so germinate. So we just realize this is what's going to germinate or run that, that replenishing process, all right, because of the active mitosis. All right, and 10 to 25 percent of layers also are composed of melanocytes. And remember, melanocytes are these adult cells that produce melanin that's going to darken as you get exposure to, this, to the sun. <clears throat> so suntan or tanning or whatever, as you're exposed to the sun, they become darker and darker. And their job is to really protect the deep layers down here. We don't want the UV rays getting, the UV rays getting to the mitotic um, cells down here with the nucleus. We don't want to alter that DNA. So if we alter the DNA, it's going to start potentially start reproducing defective proteins, and then we can set ourselves up for basal cell carcinoma or um, or worse. All right, so we can start um, setting ourselves up for skin cancer if we get any kind of alteration in that DNA. So there's spinosum or prickly layer, and you can just tell by the shape of it. And we'll see that coming up. <clears throat> These are several um, layers thick contains a web-like system of intermediate pre-keratin fibers attached to the desmosomes. Remember, desmosomes are those, those rivets or those anchoring systems that anchor these cells together so that nothing can penetrate and get. We really don't want anything getting down here um, as far as anything or base of infection, staph, um, you know, E. coli or Proteus or any of these uh, antimicrobials, we don't, get them, we don't want them getting into the bloodstream. We don't want a systemic infection, all right? So keratinocytes in this layer appear spiky, so they're called prickle cells, and they're gonna have these spikes on them, and they're really there for attachment. They're really gonna be anchoring into the area. Scattered among keratinocytes um, are abundant um, melanosomes and dendritic cells. So these are gonna be scattered among these adult keratin cells, and they have melanosomes or these um, pockets to produce melanin. We already want the melanosomes there. So if we need to produce melanin, we don't want to wait for this product to be there. We want it already be, to be there. We want to be able to activate it on demand to produce um, melanin to darken that skin as soon as possible. All right. And remember, once again, these dendritic cells or Langerhans cells are there for antigen presented, uh, presentation to the immune system. So if anything were to get deeper down in here, we want these dendritic cells to be able to capture it and let the immune system know, listen, we just found these antigenic particles uh, in this area. Do we already have antibodies to it? If we do, I need you to produce memory cells and send some T cells out to recognize this and destroy this before it becomes systemic. All right, so the granulosum is the next layer down. That's layer three. All right, so these are really thin, four to six uh, cells thick, but the cells are flattened, so the layer is thin. It's just really there as a thin barrier. All right, so these uh, cells are flattened. They have nuclei and organelles that are disintegrated. So remember, these were coming up from these mitotic divisions. They're not completely dead, but as these come up, you start changing from full-grown cells. They're, these are deeper. They're on their way up, all right? So keratination, uh, keratinization begins here. So they were really alive. As they come up here, they start disintegrating. The organelles get a little weird. They're, they're slowly dying. They're not going to be fully effective. So it's just really kind of a transitional zone for them. So keratination, uh, keratinization begins. Cells um, accumulate keratohyalonic granules, and this is kind of like pre-cartilage material. It helps form keratin fibers in the upper layers. These transform into keratin. And keratin was that protein. All right, so they kind of, they, are, um, they transform into the keratin fibers, which are currently dead and they're really there for just protection. All right, and so uh, these cells accumulate uh, lamellar granules, water-resistant glycolipids that slows water loss. So we have those Glyco sugar fats, they kind of float up here. And you know, you, we kind of know that lipids and water don't mix. So this is really a pre-oily or pre-lipid layer so that if you are submerged or uh, an area that has a lot of moisture, um, we don't want that moisture getting deep into here. And we also don't want any of our um, 
uh, water or area of, yeah, any kind of hydration or extracellular fluids. We don't want it to evaporate. We want to keep that all in here. All right, so let's just imagine if you were not near a, a big water supply, you're in the desert or whatever. We don't really want to lose any of that fluid. So we want to have that oily layer here to insulate and keep that um, fluid in there. We don't want these cells dehydrating and losing their function. And so any cells above this layer um, die, all right? <clears throat> so they're too far from this area to live. So as they get into this transitional area, they literally start changing shape, they start turning into keratin, and they're pretty much almost completely dead. All right. Alusium, remember, that's that clear layer. And this is not in all of uh, skin types. This is only really found only in the very thick skin. So if you had a callus or the sole of your foot or an area that had a, hot, a lot of abrasion, these would be very, very thick. And they're really just there for protection. All right. All right. <clears throat> And the same corneum or the horny layer, and horny as in their spike. It's really there for an attachment type of, of thing. So 20 to 30 rows of flat anucleate keratinized dead cells. So here's a couple of clues. Right. So these are going to be the, the most superficial of all of them. Remember, these are anucleated. So if they don't have a nucleus, they can't regenerate. We already know as they move up here, they're dying. So these are just anucleated keratinized dead cells, and they're really just there for protection. You can lose them, they're, I don't want to think of them as pawns, but they're there just for protection, to slough them off so we can really protect the lower. It's kind of like an armor. They're really there to protect everything lower that's alive and active and mitotic and serving a purpose. <clears throat> so these are, uh, counts for uh, three quarters of the epidermal thickness, majority of it right here, all right. Uh, <clears throat> These are, um, although they're dead, <clears throat> st they still have a function of protect deeper cells from the environment. It's kind of like the armor, like I said. They prevent water loss, they protect from abrasion and uh, penetration, and they act as a barrier against biological, chemical, and physical assault. <clears throat> so these, this is your skin here. It's going to protect you against um, any kind of, let's say you were dealing with chemicals or acid or, or um, Anything biological, if you were bit or whatever, this is kind of a dead layer. It really is there just as an armor or a shield against anything so it doesn't get any lower, right? <clears throat> Cells change by going through apoptosis, so that word should be um, familiar. That's controlled cell death. So these cells should die when they're no longer needed, and we want, and, we, want, uh, we don't want to be overcrowded or overpopulated. So these should just die that's controlled. They automatically know when they're gonna they die and they're not gonna regenerate. So dead cells slough off as dander um, or dandruff. And dander is really just your dead skin that produces the, the dust in your house or whatever. Humans can shed 50,000 cells every minute. Right? <clears throat> so there's just a diagram. A grammatic layer of uh, what they look like. So this is actually what they look like as stained. It looks like they used uh, methylene blue or uh, hmm, maybe a synophil, I'm not sure. Probably methylene blue there. And these are just your literally your layers. So remember basal is your deepest layer. This is going to be towards your capillary bed. And as they go up, they become less and less alive. So just kind of be familiar with those layers. They generally will ask you a question from superficial deep, they'll ask you like the orders, just so we can kind of figure out that you, you know uh, what the layers are. Right? So the dermis is that strong, flexible, connective tissue. Uh, cells include the fibroblasts, macrophages, and occasionally mast cells and white blood cells. All right, so fibroblasts are gonna produce um, fibrin or fibrous cells. And these can, these are blasts. So blasts always means these are immature cells or not quite sites. The fibrocytes, they'd be adult cells. Fibroblast cells are younger cells. <clears throat> they can um, regenerate and they can also alter um, what they can do. They're a little bit more flexible. Macrophages, again, macro means big. Phage means to eat. These are macrophages. These are great big scavenger cells. They go in and clean up any dead material inflammatory process 
And they also can go in, they can consume things that are foreign and they process that for the immune system. They generate the antigens they put on the immune system so your immune system can, can uh, pick up those antigens, recognize them as foreign and produce an antigen uh, antibody reaction to that. And then occasionally we have mast cells, all right? So mast cells are literally, um, they're basal fills that left the bloodstream. Mast cells actually stay in the, the outer tissues that are exposed to the environment, all right? And their job is the same as a basal fill. So these are really elevated, any kind of allergic reaction, all right? Sometimes they can be elevated um, in parasitic infections, but generally if they ask you a question on mast cells, they came from basal fills, and they stay in your tissue and their job really is for the inflammatory process um, or an allergic reaction, all right? All right, and your white blood cells are there and they're just saying generally white blood cells. I mean, you think of white blood cells, generically, that's really your immune system. So it could be a neutrophil, basophil, a cinephil, or so on. These are just classified as your basic white blood cells. All right, so fibers in the matrix bind the body together, makes up the high that is used to make leather. So this is actually what you're gonna use for um, belts or jackets or shoes or whatever, um, any kind of uh, dermis of uh, an animal, any kind of mammal, basically. Contains nerve, blood vessels, and lymphatic vessels. Right? Contains uh, epidermal hair follicles, oil glands, and sweat glands. Right? So we basically have um, two layers, the papillary layer and the reticular layer. And these are gonna be, one's gonna be superficial, one's gonna be more, uh, more deep, all right? So there's epi, remember, epi always means above the dermis. Epi means above or on. There's your dermis, right? And once again, this tissue here is what you're gonna really use for um, the hide. So if you look at processed leather, remember that we process the leather for belts and shoes. It was going to have that smooth surface, and the bottom surface is where that spiny uh, retinacular layer is. And that would really be, um, if you want a picture, that would be more like your suede. All right, so suede is when we take that surface and we turn it outward. So more of a suede is going to be your deeper layer. If you look at the dermis layer where the leather is, you realize it's really, really smooth. So we're going to process that, make it shiny. Anything underneath that is really deep to the dermis, and that's going to be. Um, you know, if you're looking at the inside of his shoes or whatever, they're a little bit rougher or more suede-like um, in consistency, right? So the papillary layer is a superficial layer of areolar connective tissue consisting of loose, interlaced collagen and elastin fibers and blood vessels. All right, so I think we already talked a little bit about collagen or elastic fibers. And collagen and elastic fibers are gonna be there for, these are connective tissue, so they're there for support. Collagen is a little bit more durable. Elastic fibers are gonna be there. They're durable, but they allow a little bit of stretch. So sometimes we need things that are durable. We need a little give to it. So we'd have more of elastic fibers there. So loose fibers allow um, phagocytes. All right, so those are eat, large eating cells. So phagocytes are gonna be your monocytes and your macrophages to patrol for microorganisms. And once again, these phagocytes, um, Phago means to eat, sites are adult cells. They're gonna go in and they're literally consuming things and processing those microorganisms or those antigens or those foreign materials to the immune system. So the immune system uh, has an idea of what potentially could be getting deep to these tissues or start infecting the tissues, all right? Dermal papillae, you'll see a picture of this coming up. These are superficial regions of the dermis that send finger-like projections up into the epidermis, right? And we'll see a picture later on about these dermal ridges, which makes up your fingerprints. It's really there for um, uh, sensation and a lot for surface area and tactile um, perception. Protections contain capillary loops, so there's gonna be a lot of blood supply, free nerve endings and touch receptors. So tactile corpuscles called um, Meissner corpuscles. So these are gonna be for your fine touch, like your fingertips. Fingertips are very, very sensitive. Um, you know, like if you're doing braille or any kind of fine motor skills, you want, you're gonna be training these nerve fibers for very, very fine touch. 
All right, in thick skin, the dermal papillae uh, lie on top of the dermal ridges, which give rise to the epidermal ridges. Remember, these are your fingerprints, and they're really designed to be uh, usually moist, like leading fingerprints. These are friction ribbons, uh, friction ridges, and when they're moist, they grip a lot better. All right, these contribute to the sense of touch, and sweat pores and ridges leave unique fingerprint patterns. And everyone's are unique. Um, unless you have an identical twin, and even then they say that sometimes the identical twins, their fingerprints aren't exactly the same. Right? So there's just a magnification of that. All right? But you see these actually these ridges, these are usually moist, all right? so they grip a little better um, in certain um, conditions. All right? So the reticular layer, which is one of three, makes up 80% of the dermal thickness. All right, it's going to make up the majority of that thickness. It consists of coarse, dense, fibrous connective tissue. Uh, many elastic fibers provide stretch and recoil properties. Sometimes we want strength, but we want it to be able to um, stretch, have a little give, and recoil. We don't want it to stay in that um, position or in that um, configuration. Right? So collagen fibers provide strength and resil or resiliency. These bind water, keeping the skin hydrated. All right, and you know, we've all talked about, you know, you've all heard about collagen injections, and as you get older, if the, if the, uh, the body can't reproduce the collagen, <clears throat> things start flattening out. You can go in and get uh, collagen injections to keep that um, pumped up or fuller. Right? So the cutaneous plexus. So cutaneous always means surface. All right, so cutaneous plexus, network of blood vessels between the reticular layer and the hypodermis. Hypo always means under. All right, so it's a network of blood vessels uh, between reticular layers and hypodermis. So we'll just realize if you're talking about blood vessels, just think in your head, <clears throat> that's always going to be deep. All right, so the deeper it is, we're always going to go into um, sensory, we're touch, pressure, hair follicles. Deep that, we're going to talk, start talking about the blood supply, basement membrane, and then getting into subcutaneous fat, lymphatic supply, and whatever. So just really start thinking in your head from superficial deep, what's going on, why is it there, form follows function, right? The extracellular matrix contains pockets of adipose tissue, so that is there for cushioning and to hold in heat, right? kind of like bubble wrap or a very, very thin blanket. We want that there. And like I mentioned earlier, the older population, you know, 80, 90, 100 or whatever, these start um, going through apoptosis. All right, well actually fat cells don't regenerate, but they start um, getting broken down or they're really not filled. Um, you only have so many adipose cells, all right? So if you, become more and more obese or larger and larger. It's the same amount of cells, we just put more adipose tissue into those cells. But these start breaking down or losing all of their um, cytoplasm, so they get very, very thin. And that's why the older population is that very, very thin skin. And um, you know, they, like I said, they get cold very easily, they bruise easily, they tear easily. Um, they bump into something, there's gonna be a big black and blue mark. Um, any kind of trauma, they can have uh, ecchymosis, which is pinpoint bleeding when the capillary beds break. All right, and it breaks very easily because there's no bubble wrap or no lipid or adipose cells around them. All right, just gonna skip here. All right, so cleavage or tension lines. All right, so if we're gonna look at the body planes, they're designed to have these cleavage furrows or cleavage lines, and they particularly are caused by many collagen fibers warning parallel the skin surface, all right? So externally, they're invisible, all right? But if you're going to do any kind of plastic surgery or any kind of surgery, if you caught along these cleavage lines, all right, in the, in the same plane as those, and you re-sew them up, the surgical um, incisions heal faster and they're less visible. So important to surgeons because incisions parallel the cleavage lines heal more readily, right? <clears throat> All right, and as you start working with um, patients or whatever, um, if you look, if someone's had a face up or whatever, you can look behind the ears. They're going to follow those cleavage lines. They kind of do the um, incisions there. 
they're not as noticeable because you're not going across the, the cleavage furrow, they're less noticeable. And they actually heal much, much faster. Right. So flexure lines of particular layer are dermal folds at or near joints. All right, so just think of any joint in your body, whether it is a, a finger joint, elbow, knee, any kind of a joint where two bones articulate. Remember, you're gonna have that hyaline cartilage um, where there's contact points. And the dermis is tightly secured to deep structures because we want the joints to be movable. We want them to be um, structurally sound. We don't want them, because um, joints are moving, there's a lot of wear and tear. We want them to be structurally sound. So skin's inability to slide easily from joint uh, movement causes deep creases. And if you look like the ridges of your hand, you'll see these are flexure lines. So we want these actually riveted there. We want to be able to move, but we don't want this to tear or come loose. So if you look at any of your joints, you're gonna be able to see these flexure lines and they're there for um, deep seated detachment, but everything around it is designed to be able to move. And there, if you look at your toes, like the, <clears throat> the um, dorsal or plantar surface of that, you'll be able to see all of these. All right, the, the um, wrinkles of your toes or underneath where your toes can bend, or if you look at the soles of your feet, uh, reflexology or whatever, you'll see these flexure lines going on. All right. So extreme stretching of skin can cause dermal tears, leaving silvery or white scars called striae, also known as stretch marks. So if you've had surgery, inguinal, um, hiatal hernia, or um, women who you know gone through gestational period and are gravid have had babies, you'll see. All right, we're extremely stretching these dermal uh, lines, flex, flexion places. We stretch them beyond what would we would normally expect, and sometimes they can leave um, silver or white scar called striae. And you'll still see these coming up in practice, <clears throat> or whatever you'll see them. So acute short-term traumas to skin can cause blisters. We've all probably had these. It's really where they we just separate the layers and fluid fills it up. All right, it separates the epidermis from the dermal layers. It fills with fluid. You know, you can go in and pop it and drain it, or you can just let it go. Um, but generally, <clears throat> sometimes they don't actually reheal. We just wait for that superficial layer to wear off, and then the layer deep will, through my tight division, will grow up towards the superficial surface and replace that. All right, so there's uh, stretch marks. Right. So this is the collagen was just extremely stretched. So this person either had a very large baby or, you know, possibly, you know, we could say they had twins or triplets or whatever. So we just stretched it beyond what you would expect. Right. All right. So skin color, the three pigments can be to skin color and melanin. We talked about melanocytes and their job was to produce melanin from that precursor. <clears throat> Uh, melanin uh, zones, there's those vacuoles that are there, so we have the components ready to be activated whenever we need it. Only pigment made in the skin, made by melanocytes, so remember, these are adult cells, made from amino acid, tyrosine or tyrosine uh, ACE. ACE is always the enzyme that activates <clears throat> something, so packaged into melanosomes, these are pockets or somes or vacuoles that are sent to shield the DNA or uh, carinocytes from the damaging UV. The more sun, the more need for protective shield, the more melanin will be produced. There's two forms, reddish yellow and blackish brown. All right. So skin color differences are due to the amount and form of melanin. All right. You can trace um, <clears throat> the origins of the, the seven races back to whatever parts of the uh, European continents or whatever and just realize their melanin, um, genetically, their melanin um, constituents were different depending on the skin color. Freckles and pigment, pigment and moles are local accumulations of melanin. So if you've seen any more freckles or moles, these are just uh, melanin that didn't disperse. They're just kind of um, vacuoles or pockets that kind of grew together, right? And then, if, of course, if you have a melon, or if you have a mole or freckle, you want to just check the ABCs, and these are the asymmetry, um, border, color, um, density. You want to check to see if any of that changes, because if it changes, it could be precancers. You want to just check the ABCs of any kind of skin tag, mole, freckle, or whatever it happens to be. And I think your book gets into that. I'm pretty sure. 
right. <clears throat> so excessive sun exposure damages your skin. Excessive uh, fibrous clump causing skin to become leathery, and we've probably all seen um, men and women, you know, if they spend a lot of time on the beach or a lot of the golf, time in the golf course and they're not wearing hats or protect, uh, protecting their skin with UV um, protectants, um, we've all seen the effects of that. All right. Hey, Eric, your video just went on. So um, can depress the immune system and cause alterations in DNA that lead to skin cancer? And we'll see pictures of that coming up. So you want to protect that. UV light destroys folic acid. All right, so folic acid is extremely important to vitamin B9. All right, because you're in <clears throat> embryology, the, um, the neural tube is the first thing to develop. You need that. And folic acid, you absolutely need for DNA synthesis, for those codons and those nucleotides to reproduce those proteins. So insufficient folic acid is especially dangerous for developing embryos. That's why anyone of childbearing years has to consume vitamin B9, folic acid, for that first um, trimester when the neural tube and a lot of the organs, the heart, um, start developing without folic acid, you can get into a lot of these um, birth defects, whether it's cleft palate or spina bifida or some of the other major birth defects that are direct links to the, um, the um, dearth or the, the um, not enough folic acid to run the the codons for the protein synthesis. All right, so photosensitivity is in, uh, increased reaction to sun. And then some people, some drugs or antibiotic or antihistamines and perfumes can cause photosensitivity. So they could just say, you know, I went out in the sun, it was only for 20 minutes, I had this complete major reaction, my skin is all red and blistered, it's just not normal. Then you say, well, you know what? Were well, you taking a new antibiotic, uh, an antihistamine, you take something, did you have um, try a new cologne that was on the skin, or did you try a different, um, you know, even different laundry detergents or different fabric softeners? If those are um, there's remnants in the, um, the clothing and it affects the skin, the photosensitivity hits it, it can cause a, re a reaction that normally wouldn't take place. But generally, if they have a reaction, they're on some kind of medication, antibiotics, or antihistamine. Right, antihistamines, you know, we'll talk a little bit about how they stop the mast cells and um, things like that. But the sun can trigger that, can trigger some major inflammatory reactions with that. All right, keratin, we probably all heard of that, or vitamin A, or maybe you know somebody who's uh, vegan, if they eat too many carrots, um, yellow the orange pigment. And we had uh, somebody in my graduating class who was just vegan it was just to eat carrots constantly and by the middle of second trimester i turned to her her name was karen i'm like karen listen you got to lay off the carrot she's like why so literally you're turning orange for real this girl was completely turning orange from all the keratin she built up and it was being deposited in her skin so most obvious in palms and soles because remember that has that lucidia layer that's clear so these pigments are going to start um, depositing in there. They're going to see their, their skin, the, pul the uh, palm of their hands or their soles are going to become orange or very, very weird yellow. All right, accumulates in the stratum, corneum, and hypodermis. So accumulates there. Can be converted to vitamin A for vision and, uh, and epidural health. All right, and hemoglobin, hopefully we're all familiar with that. All right, <clears throat> pinkish hue of fair hair is due to lower levels of melanin. All right, so when uh, somebody's very, very, um, you know, you could say they're blue blood and they're very, very fair. They don't have a lot of melanin. You can actually see, and if you know what a pulse ox meter is, they put it on your, on your finger and people say, well, how in the world can that determine the oxygenation level of my hemoglobin? Well, it actually goes in, takes, um, sends a light beam in, and if your blood is um, oxygenated, the hemoglobin, is darker. So um, if it's not oxygen, deoxygenated um, hemoglobin, um, it's more blue, all right? And it's a different in light rays coming through. Right? So skin of Caucasians is more transparent, so color of hemoglobin shows through. You know, if you, you know, you've probably heard of the word blue bloods or whatever. So these are people um, 
the hemoglobin literally shows through or the oxygen to the hemoglobin. Or if you see someone who is uh, hypoxic or very, very cold where their, their capillary beds are constricted, they literally will turn blue. All right, there's not a lot of perfusion going on with that. All right. Oh, here it is. So cyanosis. All right, blue skin color, low oxygen of hemoglobin. That's how really all these pulse oximeters work. Paler, blanching or pale color can be caused by anemia, low blood pressure, fear, anger. You know, you could say, well, this person turned white, or this person turned blue. All right, from shock because literally their um, cutaneous capillary beds constricted. There was no blood perfusion to the superficial tissues or the skin, and literally they looked like they went white or blue, or they were white as a ghost, is another expression. Um, erythema, or like erythrocytes, E R Y T H, generally always means red. All right, so if you ever see that in a test or a board exam or whatever, that always means red, that, that prefix there. So it can be for, from fever, hypertension, uh, uh, inflammation, or allergy. And jaundice, the yellow cast, is usually from liver disorders, has to do with um, unconjugated bilirubin not going to the liver um, because of liver damage. So with jaundice, your skin's going to have a very, very yellow cast to it. All right. Um, and you can pretty much tell, no matter what nationality it is, it's going to change the skin color a little bit. And if you're unsure, just look at the whites of the eyes. It'll generally have a yellow cast to it. But as you get into practice and start seeing more people, you're going to see that no matter what the nationality is going to have more of a yellow cast to it, or sometimes it'll have like a really strange green hue to it. But that will come with time, just looking at people. You'll be able to look at people after, you know, maybe four or five years in practice or whatever, and look at them and say, there's something wrong with that skin. They have some kind of liver issue. So whether they have, um, source of liver, they have hepatitis, you know, maybe they got it from uh, tattoos or, or whatever. You'll be able to look at that skin color and say, it doesn't look like there's, there's a weird cast to it. And that will come with time. So bruises, black and blue marks. Remember, these are ecchymosis, hematomas, um, contusions are the same thing, or patechia. So these are when the capillary beds are damaged, a little bit of blood starts accumulating. So if there's a lot of damage, a lot of blood breaks in the capillary bed, it becomes very, very superficial. And that's where you see that um, blood clotting outside of uh, the capillary bed. So blood should always clot the minute it leaves your bloodstream or capillary bed, that's normal. Blood should never clot inside of your capillary bed. So if you have um, intravascular coagulation of any type, that's usually from infection or um, sometimes it can be from um, a strep or staph infection, that's something you really want to um, look into, investigate that. Because we don't want blood clotting inside your capillary bed. It starts causing ischemia and uh, diffuse um, tissue perfusion and can cause major, major uh, damage to cells, organs, and tissues. Not a good thing at all. all. Right. So as the clot is broken down, the color of the bruises change, and that can take anywhere from <clears throat> two days to two weeks to a month, depending on how bad the damage is. All right, somebody in a really bad car accident or somebody who is um, generally older or, or didn't have a lot of adipose tissue, some of that bruising can take weeks to months to, um, to heal. All right, so brown or black necklace or bruises, hyperpigment areas in the axle or armpit or around the neck may be a sign of insulin resistance or elevated blood glucose levels. All right, so we'll just talk briefly about hair. I'm not that concerned about it, um, but you may um, get a question on it, or sometimes they ask, um, board questions will ask, or sometimes your um, entrance exam for um, some grad schools will ask you just random questions about that. All right, but remember your hair consists of dead keratinized cells. All right, so remember when you're looking at someone, that superficial layer is always keratinized cells, and they're completely dead. Right. You, can, you can scrape the top of your skin, you don't feel it, and it doesn't bleed, it's avascular. You can cut your hair, it doesn't hurt, it's dead. All right. None are located on the palms, soles, lips, nipples, or portions of the external genitalia. All right. So areas of the 
of the skin don't have those hair follicles, so hair can't grow, all right, functions. Warn of insects on the skin, if it lands there, you have, remember, you have all those um, tactile cells, all right, when you land on the, on the hair, it bends it, it triggers these um, afferent nerve fibers to send um, impulses to your homunculus, and your homunculus can register exactly where that is on the body. It's all mapped out in your brain in the cerebral cortex. All right, here on the uh, head guards against physical trauma, protect some heat loss, right? Shields uh, skin from the sunlight. All right, so just remember, whether you have hair or not, all right, you're gonna lose a lot of your body heat to your head, all right? So you probably notice in the winter you wanna put a hat on, or um, yeah, if you have a long hair uh, in the summer, it can get really, really hot. It's really holding that heat in. So hair is also called pili, or um, flexible strands of dead keratinized skin. So remember pili, later on when you start seeing pili anywhere, it's going to be like a hair-like structure. So hair or pili, whenever you see that, kind of relate those two words together. Produced by hair follicles. All right, and hair, remember hair follicles can get infected. There's oil or sebaceous glands in there, so bacteria can get in there. Hair follicles can stop producing hair or hair follicles, some of the, the color, uh, the melanocytes in the hair. As you get older, they don't produce melanocytes and they get filled with air. That's how you get gray hair, that's how it happens. So it contains hard keratin, not like the soft stuff found in your skin, so it's much, much harder keratin. All right, hard keratin is tougher and more durable. The cells don't flake off, but you can lose um, you know, strands of hair constantly. They're constantly growing. All right, if you've ever gone in for any kind of um, laser treatment uh, for hair removal, they can only, when they shoot the laser in for the hair follicle, it will only kill the hair during the growth phase. You really have to go in four or five times. When they hit that with a laser, unless it's hitting that hair, sending the light down the hair shaft, um, it won't kill the hair follicle unless that hair follicle is actually in the growth stage. And you're, you're Hair cells are not constantly a growth phase. They kind of alternate. All right, so regions. We have the shaft is the area that extends above the scalp. The keratinized is complete. That's part you can see. It's partly cut or shave or whatever. The root is the area within the scalp where keratinization is still going on. So remember, your hair is literally, it's alive in the hair follicle in the scalp or the skin. And as it leaves, once it leaves is the surface of the skin, well, halfway up, it becomes dead, right? So there's three parts of the hair. All right, so I want to point something out here. <clears throat> You're going to see two words here, medulla and cortex. So no matter what we're talking about, the brain, a kidney, the adrenal glands, the hair shaft, medulla is always center. No exceptions that I know of. Cortex is always on the outside. So we're talking about the brain. The medulla is in the middle of the brain. Cortex is the out, outer surface. Kidney, middle is the medulla outsides of cortex. Adrenal glands, middles of medulla, outsides of cortex. So get those two words in your head now. Medulla is the center core of large cells and air spaces. The cortex is several layers of flattened cells surrounding the medulla. Right. And the cuticle is the outer layer consisting of overlapping layers of single cells. All right, and you're gonna see, we're gonna see coming up here with the cuticle of your nail and so on. So these words are gonna come up and they generally have a, um, they serve a purpose or they're usually talking about a region or an orientation. All right, so I know guys, we're only in week five or whatever, and it, it's probably getting very, very confusing. But just start learning these words now, start learning your vocabulary, because these words or terms are gonna show up continuously. And as long as you know what the root is or what they generally mean, you can figure out what they're asking you or what it should mean. It'll help be very, very helpful. So hair pigments are made by melanocytes, just like in the skin and hair follicles, combinations of different melanins, yellow, rust, brown, black, create all the hair colors. Red has additional phenomelanin pigment, which is only uh, in obviously redheads. Gray or white hair results when melanin production decreases and air bubbles replace the melanin and the shaft. All right. <clears throat> All right, so there, like I said, like there's, there's a medulla, middle, cortex, and then the cuticle. 
out here. All right. All right, so the structure of the hair follicle. So just really just kind of read through this and look through it. <clears throat> it extends from the epidermis surface to the dermis. There, and so we're gonna go from superficial to deep. We're talking about the actual hair follicle where the hair grows. Remember the outer surface, <clears throat> the superficial is dead. As you go down into the shaft, which produces the hair, it's gonna become more and more alive. And there's things going on in there. Um, all right. The other thing that I see a lot of questions on is the erect, erector pili muscle. Remember, pili means hair like. Erector pili is that muscle. When you go back at the, <clears throat> the hair, the, the diagram, the picture, look at the hair follicle, and you can see a little tiny muscle next to it. And this is the erector pili muscle. So remember, as this constricts, it's going to cause that hair follicle to stand up on end. It's going to pull it taut. So um, <clears throat> that, like if you have the hair sitting up on your arm or the back of your neck, that can be from fear. If you, uh, you know, Halloween, obviously is right around the corner here. If you frighten a cat or whatever, the hair will stand up. <clears throat> That's, the, the cat's in fear, but it also in nature, it's going to make that cat appear bigger. It makes it appear scarier. Right. So the erector pili muscles are a muscle that causes the hair follicle to become stand up on end or become erect. All right, so sometimes that can literally hold in heat. If you're cold, it can make um, you look bigger. It can be more sensory if you want that. It's, it's much more um, triggered for sensation. Responsible for the goosebumps you can see. All right. All right, and your book talks a little bit about the different types of hair. So villus or vellus is the pale, fine body hair of children and adult females. You know, most females will have hair on their body, but it's going to usually, um, usually be white and very, very fine. They're not children. It's very, very white and very, very fine. And then your terminal hair is your coarse, long hair. All right. So the villus hair, you know, males are depending on the sexual uh, maturation of the person. It becomes coarser, longer, found in your scalp and eyebrows, this is your normal hair. And at puberty, you start producing the hair and the armpits or the pubic region, all right? Also in the face and necks of males, um, nutrition and hormones can affect hair growth. And I think your book talks a little bit about, too, about um, <clears throat> you know, male pattern baldness or bald men. They actually have more of certain types of um, male hormone, um, I can't think of testosterone or derivative of that. Um, which causes the hair um, to stop growing, right? And hitcherism is, um, can result in excessive hairiness of hitcherism, um, as well as other signs of masculinity. So that could be from a um, excess of testosterone or lack of estrogen, which, which kind of masks testosterone. So please realize women can produce testosterone if they don't have estrogen to counterbalance that they can get um or hysterism um you know some unfortunately some uh women after they get to be um 40 or 50 they can start growing uh facial hair um you know postmenopause women can grow sort of like a like a very very fine mustache or whatever this can happen to it's not really a clinical problem. It isn't pathological, but it can have a lot of um, social or emotional issues to it. All right. Alopecia, if you come across that word, is hair thinning in both sexes after age of 40. We generally don't really consider um, male pattern baldness or male baldness to be alopecia, but women, if they start losing their hair, all right, um, and you can just have bald patches, and this can be triggered by stress, all right, so true or very, very frank or complete baldness is a genetic termination or sex and fullest condition. And here it just says male pattern baldness caused by follicular response to DHT, dihydrotestosterone. So there's certain derivatives of testosterone that can trigger this in males. All right, so it just means generally they have a little bit more testosterone than um, derivative of, than other men, all right? Um, Skip to that. All right. 
<clears throat> so I'm not going to test you guys on any part of the nail, but just be familiar with the portions of the nail. I think you have enough to, to learn, but I would uh, certainly hope that you would at least read this over and know portions of it. Um, I don't know if you're going into any part of that in healthcare, but just be familiar with it. It's for myself, it's not a testable item. You guys have got enough to learn about. I'm not really that um, worried about it or that concerned about it. It's not a, a major priority. Right, so just know the portions of the nail. Right? And just realize, read some of this in your book, but you can tell by um, club fingers or if people have ridges in their nail or dips in their nail, it can really be a sign to certain things going on in the body. So don't, when you look at a patient, you're doing a patient assessment, you guys probably may not be there yet, or some of you are probably in healthcare and, and don't realize it. Or But some of the older population have looked at their nails, if they curve in, if there's ridges, um, it can really trigger you to look at some nutritional de deficiencies or they may have been on some kind of lengthy um, medical treatment or medication that can start affecting the nails, all right? Yeah, spoon nails and outward concavity of the nail may signal iron deficiency, which is much more common than we think. Bose lines or horizontal lines, all right, may indicate severe illness such as uncontrolled diabetes, heart attack, or cancer chemotherapy. So don't be afraid to look at someone's nails, right? And you can, you can make some relatively accurate diagnoses from them, just looking at their nails, their skin, look at their eyebrows, see if there's anything going on. Because remember, your integumentary system is the largest organ in your body, all right? So it's there for secretion, it kind of keeps things away. Um, but you can tell a lot by someone's skin, all right? If you, if you look for it, and after you've been in the field a while, you just look at them and know something's not quite right. And then with experience, you'll just be able to figure out what's going on. All right, so there's that dip on those horizontal lines. That's probably from some kind of iron deficiency, likely, or some kind of nutritional deficiency. All right, so some of the glands here, pseudoriferous glands, all right, so these can generally um, produce some kind of um, odors if certain bacteria go and consume it and start fermenting it and start producing waste products. Uh, it can produce some kind of uh, body odor. So all skin services except the nipples and parts of the external genitalia contain sweat glands. Right? And some people literally, you're gonna meet some people that generally just don't sweat. Right? They may not have a lot of sweat glands or they just really, I know some people that just don't sweat. All right. so there's two main types, eccrine glands or miracrine um, sweat glands or apocrine. All right, and we'll realize some of these are gonna be whether they secrete on the surface or whether that, that gland um, breaks apart or whether or they're in a, a tube and they go towards the surface. So we'll just see how some of these different glands work. All right. All right. So eccrine or miracrine sweat glands are the most numerous. Abundant on the palms, soles, and forehead. You know, you know, you'll notice even yourself. If somebody is nervous or they're sweating, generally they're going to be wiping their brows. It's going to be the first place to sweat. The palm of their hands, they get sweaty. Their feet get real sweaty. So generally, this is the first area that you can notice it. These ducts connect directly to the pores, or right, function in thermal regulation. So they're really there to um, sweat. And as they sweat, we lose... Um, fluid and with that comes body heat. So as the breeze comes along and evaporates that, we're dissipating heat, all right? So if we get overwhelmed, we wanna sweat, we wanna take the heat with us, because you know it takes energy or heat to cause water to, or sweat to raise in temperature. So if we can get rid of that and have it evaporate, we're uh, getting rid of some body heat, right? Rock, regulated by the sympathetic nervous system, all right? Flight or fight. Fight or flight, all right. <clears throat> Their secretion is uh, sweat, so 99% is water. There's some salts, vitamin C, antibodies. Dermacin, um, if you take micro with me or other instructions, we can learn a little bit about. It's a microbe killing peptide, all right, keeps some microbes from growing on your skin. And we can get rid of some metabolic wastes, all right. So people that sweat more, generally get more of a metabolic waste. And you guys are gonna notice in practice as people start sweating, you're gonna be able to, to smell. Do they smoke? Do they 
uh, of any alcoholics, though we start secreting these things through their skin, all right? The liver and kidneys are supposed to get rid of it, but if it's in excess or continuous all the time, they're gonna start secreting some of these metabolic waste from nicotine, alcohol, petroleum products, or whatever. It'll actually be leaving in their sweat, all right? <clears throat> so these are some of your cutaneous glands. So cutaneous, remember, is always superficial. So then we're gonna talk a little bit about these glands. So some of these glands are gonna be deep. They're gonna to have to go all the way through these ducts. And sometimes these ducts can get clogged. And we're talking about, um, Talk about the eye, we'll talk about mobilian glands for the um, eyelashes, and we can talk about um, dermal mites. So, so but there's sometimes there's mites that live in your eyelashes, they, they start feeding off of the um, secretions in there. All right, completely disgusting, but some people have them. All right, apocrine sweat glands are confined to the axillary and anal general area. So, this is going to be your armpits and your groin area. All right, so you know if you you know don't want to get gross or whatever, but you realize see some of these areas are areas of your body that when they sweat or um, if you don't wash them as often, they can get they secrete different um, things that bacteria can get a hold of, especially staph can get a hold of, and they can start producing some some major uh, issues or. You know, sometimes people, if they have a large bacterial infection or they have a lot of these glands, they can literally shower an hour and a half later. They smell like they never took a shower. They're not to be gross, but it happens. So um, secrete viscous, always means viscosity is your thickness. Milky or yellow, you know, sweat that contains fat, substances and proteins. All right, so here's where the problem is. Bacteria break these down, consume it, leads to body odors. So you have a lot of these, or if you have um, a large microbial load, or let's say you have, let's just say you have um, some really virulent staff, no matter what you're washing with, unless it's tea tree oil or some kind of major um, pharmaceutical soap, you may not be able to kill that. So this staff, you kill most of it, but staff reproduces every 20 minutes. So you can just, wash most of that away, you leave a little bit of staph on there, it will start reproducing every 20 minutes logarithmically, and within an hour, hour and a half, two hours, you're right back to where you started. Right? Uh, larger than echocrine gla uh, sweat glands with ducts emptying into the hair follicles. Right? You, you know, you realize these axillary and anal genital areas have, you know, they should have body hair, they have these sweat glands. Or it's, emptying into the hair follicles, and this is where the bacteria start feeding. All right. Begin functioning at puberty. Function is unknown, but may act as a sexual uh, scent gland. You know, not get it, getting into the psychology of that, but, but some women or men are, are attracted to these pheromones, or um, you know, they could be turned on by um, slight or maybe funky body odor or whatever, they can be um, sexual attractants to some people, right? Tromus glands, all right, lining an external ear canal, uh, serum or earwax. So this is really very, very waxy. Um, it's very, very um, bitter, all right? And it usually is there to repel insects and spiders. And please realize too, without getting completely gross, but please realize, while you're sleeping, you've probably swallowed a spider or a bug or whatever. It, it's just, it's common, all right? But this really wants to, you want it, this is there to keep things from crawling into your ear, all right? Um, all right. And mammillary glands secrete milk, all right? Sebaceous or oil glands are widely distributed except for thick skin of palms and soles, so that's gonna be sweat, all right? Most develop from hair follicles and secrete into the hair follicles, relatively inactive until puberty, stimulated by hormones, especially androgens, usually the male hormones, but predominantly male, but females have some of it. So, um, secrete sebum, it's so oil holocrine glands. So these holocrine glands, they actually, the gland itself erupts, it kills itself, right? Bactericidal, 
has bacterial cytal um, properties, which can start um, destroying cell walls or gram positive bacteria and so on. Softens hair and skin. Right? So you, you want this to a certain degree. It keeps your skin moist, uh, it has antimicrobial properties. Um, but you know, obviously you want to, to wash that area, you know, even if it's you know, twice a month, I would hope, or whatever. Contingent upon you know what your whatever doesn't matter. All right. So there's a microscopic view of your hair follicle, and there's a more of a pictorial view of it. Unfortunately, we're not um, in a lab with microscopes, so I can't actually go in and have you find this and then trace the shaft and figure out where the superficial area is. Right. <clears throat> so just this is an um, example of the different glands and how they're, you know, this, this gland is directly attached to the, to the hair follicle. This one is here, it's got to travel up here. All right, some of these are not even the hair follicle, they're directly attached to the, to the surface. All right, and this is gonna um, secrete your sweat glands to dissipate heat. This is gonna act um, in your hair follicle in the um, axillary or, or anal genital area. Um, for that uh, area. And then the sebaceous glands are gonna be oil glands, really there to, to moist, uh, to lubricate the area to keep it from dehydrating. And it's got some antimicrobial properties in it too, right? right. <clears throat> so it's just showing you here, homeostatic imbalances. So something's out of balance or you have bacteria breeding in uh, cuts or wounds or hair follicles, you can get, um, Foruncles, carbuncles, especially with staph, they get in the hair follicles, they start, um, there's an infection, they start growing, uh, can be the cause of propiano bacteria, well, corneal propio um, bacterium causes acne infections. Whiteheads are blocked sebaceous glands. All right. If secretion is oxidized, it becomes, the whitehead becomes a blackhead. All right, and overactive sebaceous is oil glands in infants can lead to seborrhea or cradle cap. All right. <clears throat> Begins as pink raised lesions um, on the scalp that turn yellow and flake off. So we'll see a picture of that coming off. So <clears throat> it starts pink and as um, the lesions on the scalp start drying out, it can flake off. All right, staff can do the same thing. Um, usually cradle cap is caused by certain um, strains of staph too, but it doesn't matter. But there it is, and not <clears throat> um, pathogenic, but you'll see this will start peeling off in like very, very fine, I don't mean to gross, but like very, very fine cornflake or potato chip type um, pieces, All right? All right, so the functions of your skin here are some protection, obviously we talked about that. Body temperature and regulation. So please realize your body is going to dilate those capillaries, which are superficial in your skin. If it's over overwhelming, you want to shunt all that as much blood to the superficial area where there's more surface area. It's very thinner. Thinner, we want to dissipate that heat. If it's cold out, <clears throat> we want to constrict the capillary beds, shunt all that blood to the central core where the organs are, where it's warmer, so we're not losing body heat. All right. Once again, cutaneous sensations, we want to be able to feel if anything's on our skin, all right? So there's things called graphesthesia or whatever, where we could um, <clears throat> literally draw a letter on your hand or on your skin. You'd be able to map out in your brain what that letter was, all right? Depending on how many um, afferent nerve fibers are there. So some areas of your body have the uh, afferent nerves much closer together, more concentrated. So metabolic functions we talked about there. So it could be vitamin production. All right, it could be um, antimicrobial. It could be secretions of certain things. It's a blood reservoir, right? So some of your blood is in your hands and your skin, but not most of it. Most of your blood reservoir that's not in your blood is literally <clears throat> in your spleen or your veins, but we'll talk about that later in the course. All right, excretion of waste. And it causes, there's some barriers here, all right? A uh, chemical barrier, physical barrier, and biological barrier, right? So it's, remember, your skin's dead. It's there for protection. 
So your chemical barrier, your skin's gonna start secreting some of these things, all right? Sweat, like I said, dermosin is an antimicrobial protein. Sebum and defensins, uh, which kill bacteria, all right? There's defensin right there. The tears too, actually, they have antimicrobial lysomes in there that will start uh, destroying the gram-positive um, cell wall, gram-positive bacteria too. And then it has an acid vent, so low pH of the skin retards bacterial multiplication. So most bacteria, if your skin is slightly acidic, most bacteria won't live there, all right? Staph and strep will, but we can isolate that with mannitol salt water, all right? But staph and strep, um, can generally live in lower pHs, or especially, especially staff. Right. Uh, melanin uh, provides a chemical barrier against UV radiation damage, so we're not altering that DNA for mitosis um, propagation. And there's your physical barrier. So flat, dead skin, remember it's, squa it's um, striated squamous epithelium, all right? as glyco, those protein uh, sugar lipids, block water and water-soluble substances from the beginning of the, the PowerPoint here. And some chemicals have limited penetration of the skin. So let's say we were exposed to lipid-soluble substances. Usually they can pass through, all right? Because remember the biphospholipid layer of the cell, anything that's lipid-based, <clears throat> negatively charged or very, very small can pass without those... Um, protein carriers, and sometimes if something's lipid soluble, it can get in your skin, but it has to get through all these layers of the skin. All right, plant um, oleoresins or poison ivy can trigger the type four hypersensitivity with your T cells, organic solvents, acetone, paint thinner, any kind of uh, carbon-based petroleum product can get through um, heavy metals like lead or mercury. Right? That's why you can't find, usually find a, <clears throat> mercury thermometer anymore because literally it can get dissolved or it can get right through your skin and it gets into your bloodstream is very very toxic and caustic um nitroglycerin all right we put that under your tongue subregularly but that can penetrate through your skin relatively easily all right and subdermal or patches can get through your skin all right and then biological barriers we have those Epidermis has those phagocytic cells. Remember, these are those cells, dendritic cells, Langerhans, that go in and, and process these antigens and, and present them to your immune system so we can have um, antigen, antigen antibody reaction, reactions to this so we can start producing antibodies and memory cells to this. All right, dermis contains those macrophages. Remember, that means big eaters. Macrophages also activate immune system by presenting the foreign antigens to the white blood cells. I said before, macrophages, monocytes, and dendritic cells are antigen-presenting cells. They present these antigens to your immune system and let them know what's coming, and hopefully your body will produce an antibody to the antigen so we can tag it, so it can be processed effectively by your immune system. All right. All right, and then we're talking about the heavy metals that get in your skin. They can cause kidney to shut down, brain damage. All right, major, major, um, <clears throat> major, major effects of this. All right, so body temperature regulation by your skin. Just remember, you're going to be perspiring. A lot of times you are aware when you're sweating, but a lot of times it's insensible. You're sweating, you don't really even realize it. So even if you... Let's say you get done with work and you take your socks off or whatever, um, and they don't even feel wet. But please realize you were sweating through your feet. It was insensible. You were sweating. It was evaporating throughout the day. Or sometimes you get home and you take your, your socks off or whatever, and they're completely damp. So that is sensible perspiration. You've actually seen it or you were aware of that um, uh, perspiration. All right, and just realize you're perspiring all day long. All right, it's evaporating, so you're not aware of it. All right, and I mentioned before, cold external environment, dermal blood vessels constrict. So if it's cold out, remember your your capillary beds in the external part of your body are going to constrict and then shunt out the blood to the sphincters uh into larger vessels or in your body or it's warm we want to conserve that but if it's hot out we want to shunt that blood to the 
extremities, we want to be able to dissipate that heat. We want to open those capillary beds. We want the blood to flow. We want it to dissipate radiantly heat away from the body to keep us cool. <clears throat> All right. All right. And then cutaneous sensory receptors. Remember, cutaneous is superficial. So these external receptors respond to stimuli outside the body, such as temperature and touch. All right. The temperature you're not even aware of unless it's blatant. All right. So as the, the ambient temperature in the room changes or you're outside, your body, your hypothalamus is going to actually um, trigger homeostatic um, activities to, to either dilate or constrict your blood supply to either dissipate or con, uh, constrict heat. All right. And you're not even aware of touch most of the time, or you're not aware of it until you draw attention to it. So your body's processing millions of bits of information and you're not um, aware of it until we talk about it or you become aware of it or I mention it or it becomes a problem, right? Free nerve rending sense painful stimuli. I'm talking about the nervous system at the end of the semester. I've mentioned the homunculus and the cortex again. <clears throat> Remember these afferent uh, information is going up the spinal cord um, through your hypothalamus into your cortex. You literally can register on the map in your brain where these painful or even pleasurable or any kind of these <clears throat> sensations are coming from. You can map it out. You know exactly where it is. So if I blindfolded you and stabbed you with a pin or whatever, you would know exactly where the pin was without even seeing it or knowing because those um, nerve fibers are going right up to your cerebral cortex. And there's something called the homunculus, which maps it out in detail. You know exactly where it is. And you can send a response right back to the same area to respond to that appropriately or inappropriately, however you want to respond to that. All right, now, once again, there's all the things in your skin from superficial to deep. There's the layers. All right, I'm gonna just talk for a minute here about um, vitamin D production. So you've probably all heard about, you know, the sunlight can produce vitamin D. Well, it's kind of true. <clears throat> so your skin can produce vitamin D1. All right, it's reprocessed in your liver uh, to vitamin D2, calcidiol, all right? And it's finally done in your kidneys as calcitriol, all right? And calcitriol is the only one vitamin D3 that can help you, um, and it's there for calcium regulation, right? So unless you have vitamin D3, it's not gonna do any good with calcium, um, absorption or deposition. And without it, um, without calcium, you can't calcify um, cartilage and you can get rickets and soft bones and things like that. We'll talk about that later. All right. <clears throat> um, so your skin can synthesize vitamin D um, for calcium absorption in the intestine, but just realize as a side note, it's gotta be calcitriol vitamin D3. There's actually D1, calcitriol D2, and calcitriol D3. All right, so chemicals from uh, uh, keratinocytes can disarm some carcinogens. Remember, these are those keratin, uh, adult keratin cells in your skin. All right, and keratins can activate some hormones, convert cortisol to hydrocortisol, all right, for some pain relief, all right. Skin makes collagenase, all right, which aids in natural turnover of collagen to prevent wrinkles. And with age, sometimes it doesn't make as much collagenase, and that's why people go in for um, collagen injections, per se. All right. All right. And blood reservoir, like I said, there's not a whole lot of blood in your skin. So it does hold 5%, but it's, it's relatively negligible. And remember, your skin vessels can constrict and shunt blood to other organs. So if you are, um, let's say you're attacked or you want to exercise or you need to sprint or do something life-saving or you want to go running, your body's going to just shunt all the blood from your skin or your superficial organs to your muscles for running away or your diaphragm or your internal muscles. It's not going to be that concerned about your skin. All right. So if you're attacked or in a, a fight or held up or, you know, whatever, we can, we can, Think of any situation. Your body's going to automatically shunt blood from where it isn't absolutely essential to where it is essential. 
All right. And usually the skin is not that important in a fight or flight um, situation, generally. And just realize it does excrete things like nitrogen, ammonia, urea, and uric acid. All right. And sweat, you know, we can lose salt and water loss with sweat, whether it's sensible or, or insensible, we're aware of it or not aware of it. Um, okay, so. And then your book talks a little about skin cancer. So just realize skin cancer, and we'll talk a little bit about the rule of nines. All right, so skin cancer is when you have excess um, exposure to the sun and those melanocytes or those keratinocytes. Um, but the monocytes don't produce enough melanin or don't produce it fast enough um, to shield the, um, the lower mitotic cells in the basement area to reproduce, or if it alters it, they're going to be re reproducing um, genetically mutated DNA, possibly. And like I said, the nucleotides will go through the wrong sequence and they can start producing basal cell carcinomas or um, squamous cell carcinomas. And the thing is, no matter whether it's superficial or deep, if you catch those early enough, they're generally, um, we can get rid of them. They're, very, they're usually very, very small. And like I said, if they don't get into the base of memory to the blood supply, they're not gonna metastasize. And a lot of these are superficial on the outside. We just remove them. They don't get into the bloodstream and they're not able to reproduce. They don't breach any uh, borders per se. Right. And Burns will talk about the rule of nines, and that's really just a way of determining what percentage of the body uh, is damaged from burn. And realize that you know people think uh, infection is usually the, the number one thing that causes people uh, pathologic issues from the burns, but usually it's dehydration. All right, so dehydration can be um, mild at two percent, moderate at four, severe at um, six clinical at uh, eight, and then death around 10% of um, dehydration can cause um, major um, cell cremation and major um, dehydration. So most skin tumors are benign, they're not cancerous, and they don't spread because they don't get into the basement membrane. Usually it's overexposure to UV radiation, um, or frequent irritation of skin. If your skin has, is constantly irritated, it's going through <clears throat> those mitotic divisions in the basement up, because I said that that's what generates the mitotic rate of the daughter cells, is how much is going on in the superficial layer. So be, the more you're reproducing, um, the more rapidly you're reproducing, the more chances you are that you're gonna have some kind of um, normal mutation, right? So some skin lotions contain enzymes that can repair damaged DNA. Three major types of skin cancer. We have basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma. All right. <clears throat> so your book talks about basal cell is the least malignant. Um, the stratum cells progress slowly and invade the dermis and hypodermis. And these 99% of these cases are completely curable if you catch them in time. So these are, you know, they're really superficial. You go in, you don't ignore that. You just go in and have it um, removed. Remember, I said any kind of change in the skin, you want to do the ABCs. Asymmetry, asymmetrical, border, all right? Um, C is any kind of color change. And then diameter, if it gets bigger, usually a, a red sign, go get it checked out, all right? Squamous cell is second most, um, type. Now this can metastasize because generally it's it's deeper, right? It's deeper in the stratospinosum, right? Good prognosis if it's treated by radiation therapy or removed surgically, All right? And that is deeper, and that just looks worse, right? It's really really deep. All right. Melanoma is cancer of melanocytes. Remember, these are deeper. These are what are producing your melanin, all right? Oh, here it is. Key to survival is early detection, the ABCD rule, asymmetry, border, color, and diameter. Right. Okay, that's a melanoma, All right? And that's black as, as black as coal there because of melanin, right? That's deep. That, you may have to cut that off. I'm not sure. I'm not a, yeah, beyond my scope of practice. All right, so burns, tissue damage caused by heat, 
electricity, radiation, and certain chemicals. So it doesn't matter, you're burning that skin. Right? So most of us are familiar with heat, like you burn, um, sunburn, hot, or you got scalded with hot water, uh, you touch the hot pipe, you grab the oven rack or whatever. Electricity, all right, this can burn. And think about this for a second. Electricity, if you're electrocuted, um, that you know, is conducting electricity. And think about 70% of your body is water and fluid. So that you're literally running that current through the entire part of your body. All right, radiation. So that can be, you know, radiation obviously from the sun or it can be radiation from, you know, whatever. The microwaves or anything like that. And certain chemicals can literally burn your skin, whether it's acid, lye, or whatever. Damage caused, it denatures the proteins, destroys your cell. Remember, we denature proteins, we can't run enzymes, we can't run those metabolic processes very right, quick enough. Right, we need those catalysts and enzymes. Immediate threat is dehydration and electrolyte imbalance, it leads to renal shutdown and circulatory shock. All right, the rule of nine. So I will be asking you guys, um, like I said, I'll randomly generate your questions, but you'll all get some version of a rule of nines question. All right, body's broken into 11 sections. Each section represents 9% of the body, except the genitals, which account for 1%. All right, used to estimate volume of fluid loss. That's how it works. All right, so first degree, second and third degree, these are generally older terms. Now they use um, full partial or full burn, but it depends. And it, it, they're all synonymous, but they generally don't call them first, second degree to burns anymore. They're usually partial, full. They, they talk about um, the layers of how deep they got. First degree is epidermal damage only. All right, first degree burns, not that serious, although painful they generally heal. Second degree, epidermal and upper dermal damage is where your blisters appear. So if you have supreme sunburn, you know, it can be second, they call it second degree sunburn or second degree burns. Blisters appear. First and second degree burns are referred to as partial thickness burns because only the epidermis and upper dermis are involved. All right, so this could be, um, yeah, so the, the, generally the term now is partial thickness burn, not really second degree, but it, they're all used to notice. Third degree involves the entire thickness of the skin, so it's a full thickness burn. Skin turns gray, white, cherry red, or blackened, and the, the, the entire layer is damaged right down almost to the basement membrane. No edema is seen, and area is not painful because you literally have burned it all off, you've killed all those nerve endings, Merkel, Persinian, all those nerve endings are dead. So if the skin graft that, and it's great, you don't feel any pain then, but if those nerve endings start growing back, then it's extremely painful. All right, and there's just some pictures. All right, so first degree burn, you touch something or you grabbed it, depending on how much, you know, this person probably grabbed something very, very hot. This down at the bottom is just, all right, so burns are considered critical. 25% of the body is second degree burns. And we just realize we're, we're damaging all our tissue, but think of all the fluid we lost. So we have to do IV, regenerate those fluids immediately. All right, face, hands, and feet bear third degree burns. All right, that's deep because those, your face, hands, and feet are very, very thin in comparison. There's not a lot of muscle underneath them per se, and a lot of nerve fibers in extremely painful with that. You deprive them, we have to go in and they just clear all that burn skin out because if they don't clear it out, it's going to become infected. It's gonna be um, uh, food for um, gangrene, all right? Um, the antibiotics, nothing grows in there. You have to temporarily cover it for, uh, to keep the uh, antimicrobials out, the atmosphere out and uh, make sure it's not um, dehydrating. Do skin grafts for that. Right. And there's a rule of nine. It's just showing you the body broken down into 9% sections. Right. Okay, and then I think that's all I wanted to cover. So, sorry, I know that took forever, oh, almost two hours. All right, so I'm going to end it here. I will upload this into um,
um, YouTube, and then I'll I'll learn to blackboard. Um, I literally been on the uh, chatting with Pearson. So tomorrow, um, I'm the state board exam. So if I get a minute or two or half hour, I'm gonna get in there. I'm gonna have everyone transferred into. Um, I wrote down here. I want everyone in two six nine six eight. All right. If you guys need a case number, anyone who's listening, or you want to contact Pearson yourself, the case number is one nine one nine seven eight three eight. So if you want to contact them, tell them you want to be in J O N E S two six nine six eight. I really want to make sure that we get these assignments. Nothing is making sense because I literally. Um, this is probably my sixth conversation with Pearson. So nothing is literally making sense. So um, that's it for tonight, guys. Um, I'm trying my best at this end. If you have any questions, uh, email me. All right. And I will try to get back to you tomorrow. Once again, I'm going to be in a board exam. So I'll be busy from 6.45 to probably 4.00. If I can jump on my computer during my break, that's fine. But during the board exam, I can't answer phones or anything like that. So I am doing my best. And uh, I should be back in Buffalo Tuesday evening. And uh, barring nothing else, I will um, be on the phone personally with somebody at Pearson uh, Wednesday morning um, early. All right. Good night, everyone. I don't know how the Bills game is going, but I'm sure I will find out shortly. All right. Night.